Piers, we are live. Let's go over here to OBS, screen share, show notes, live stream, fabulous. 33 folks, not I, but the Spice Girls, good morning, none you beeswack, Jacob, Michael, Mac, Midwest, Mad Max, Mini Homesteader. Uh, show notes, 24 March 21, Bohica, which is uh, an acronym for bend over here, it comes again. Assault weapons ban, segment one, segment two, economic impacts. So on the assault weapons ban front, we're going to look first at uh, theblaze.com. I think everybody and their mom, anybody who wants to know, is up to speed on the fact that the shooting in Boulder, Colorado, which claimed 10, 10 lives the shooter, was not a white uh, extremist, a white extremist, a white nationalist. He was a Muslim guy. His name was Ahmad al Alawi Alissa. And um, yeah. So, from the range, police publicly identify Colorado supermarket mass killing suspect as 21 year old Ahmad al Alawi Alissa. Here's what we know. Victims range from 20 to 65. Dude is rocking the dad bod. Uh, I mean, who am I to talk? But rocking the dad bod over here. Boulder, Colorado authorities have identified the Monday mass killing that took the lives of at least 10 people at an area grocery store. Um, yada, yada, yada. What are the details? Alyssa on Monday and charged him with 10 counts of first degree murder, the police said Tuesday, according to the New York Post. During Tuesday conference, Boulder Police Chief Maris Herald said the authorities worked into the wee hours of Tuesday morning to remove the final victims from the grocery store. By the way, the FBI was aware of this dude before this ever happened. Um, I don't find it a coincidence that now all of a sudden, while we have a Democratic president and the, the House... And Congress sits the way that it sits, that now all of a sudden, with all of these um, assault weapons bans and gun bans being pushed, that now all of a sudden, yet again, we've got mass shooters. Um, you know, we don't even need to delve into tinfoil hat conspiracy theories. We can just simply point to history to say that when we have Democratic presidents who propose gun legislation, mass shootings happen. And yet again, we have a Democratic president with proposed gun legislation and mass shootings are happening. These are facts. They're not facts that people like, but they're facts. So, shabba dabba do. What else we got here? Um, here's a list of the victims. Eric Talley, Nevin Stanisic, Ricky Olds, Trelona Bartowiak. Susan Fountain, Terry Laker, Kevin Mahoney, Lynn Murray, Jody Waters, Denny Strong, and Eric Talley was a 51-year-old police officer. So, Biden now, uh, from OANN, OneAmericanNewsNetwork.com, Biden exploits Colorado shooting an effort to get gun control passed. Joe Biden has exploited the deadly Colorado shooting as an opportunity to call for more gun control. What a surprise. On Tuesday, Biden spoke at the White House and called for a ban on what he called assault-style weapons in high-capacity magazines. They're not high-capacity, they're standard-capacity because that's what the gun was designed to function with. So they're standard-capacity. And as far as assault, assault is a verb and I can assault you with all kinds of things, including my fists. Statistically, and we're going to look at this in a moment, but statistically, I think it was 270 something um, murders were committed last year with rifles in general. So that's not just assault style weapons, that's bolt action rifles, 22 caliber rifles, that's uh, eh, it's everything. So the argument that we need an assault weapons ban to protect the lives of innocent Americans is disingenuous at best and it's tyrannical at worst. Um, which everybody knows. This is no surprise. I'm just preaching to the choir here. Everybody knows this, but the fact of the matter is they're trying to do it yet again, and they're trying to do it at a time where political tensions are so high that this could quite possibly create the um, necessary groundwork for Civil War II, which I think is part of the plan, the big plan for they, because uh, a house divided against itself cannot stand. 
which many people say, oh yeah, Abraham Lincoln. No, Jesus said that. Uh, Abraham Lincoln just quoted him. So, we know from this administration that optics, um, they're more concerned with optics than they, co- than they are with actual legislative efficacy, as can be demonstrated by the situation on the border right now. They don't care. It's just talking points. And when I say they don't care, they don't care what the downstream ramifications are for us. It's for them to advance their agenda. And I I honestly don't even think it's about appeasing their base anymore. Because, well, there's bigger things afoot. The global uh, great reset, so forth and so on. Do we still have a live stream? We do have a live stream. 415 folks. Good morning, Aaron Goodman, Scotty Nux, Justin Mark Four. Michael Falk Badger, good morning to all the Blue Ranches. Black Rifle Bear. So Biden went on to say, I don't need to wait another minute, let alone an hour, to take common sense steps that will save the lives in the future and urge my colleagues in the House and Senate to act. The funny thing is, they're neither common sense nor will they actually save any lives. He went on to tweet, this is not a partisan issue, it's an American issue that will save lives. Congress needs to act. Disagree strongly. Uh, First of all, the right to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. And we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal and endowed by their creator, not Joseph Robinette Biden Jr., with certain inalienable rights. And among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. I will protect my life with my firearms. I will execute my personal liberty to own firearms and to use firearms not just for hunting and for sporting, but to maintain a comfortable distance from tyranny. And the pursuit of happiness. Well, that's pretty much however I define it, as long as what I'm doing that makes me happy isn't infringing infringing on you and vice versa. And so we talked about this a couple weeks ago, the very concept that the Second Amendment would be unconstitutional. It's ridiculous because it's in the freaking Constitution. It's in the Bill of Rights. So here's the deal. This is part of the big picture game plan. And I'm really not trying to be an alarmist with this. It just lines up with everything else they have going on. The United States is the last great thorn in the side of the globalists because we have the ability to resist. I don't know if we have the heart to resist as a nation, but we have the ability to resist. And now, if we look at the other side of that coin with an assault weapons ban, what does that actually accomplish? There's still hundreds of millions of weapons in this country. And the idea that somebody would go door to door to collect them, by door three, whatever unit it is that has been tasked with collecting those weapons is going to start turning into Swiss cheese. But that gets back to a house divided against itself cannot stand, which is ultimately good for the globalists. What did uh, Alex Jones say? The globalists, they're turning to frickin' frogs gay. Or whatever. Um, So over here at factcheck.org, did the 1994 assault weapons ban actually work? By Robert Farley. And of course you have links to all of this on Patreon and in YouTube on the description. So... If you need to go on a deeper dive, you can follow the links. Shout out to the 555 people who are on here. Please like, comment, subscribe, and share. Sharing gets around the YouTube algorithmic nonsense and helps us connect to more than the 600 people who are here, like the other 112,000 people who are actually subscribed to this channel but don't have our content served up to them because of shenaniganry. So, good morning. All right, buddy, appreciate y'all. Did the 1994 assault weapons ban actually work? Both sides in the gun debate are misusing academic reports on the impact of the 94 assault weapons ban, cherry-picking portions out of context to suit their arguments. And this essentially turns into a pissing contest in between Wayne LaPierre and Senate, uh, Senator Dianne Feinstein, both of which are just fine human beings. Um, <sighs> the competing claims... Testifying before the Senate Judiciary Committee on 30 Jan, LaPierre said the 94 ban that independent studies, including one from the Clinton Justice Department, proved that the ban had no impact on lowering crime. 
1997 study said its analysis failed to produce evidence of a post-ban reduction in the average number of gunshot wounds per case or in the proportion of cases involving multiple wounds. Sidebar. Clint Smith at Thunder Ranch talks about this. When police officers were issued wheel guns, six-shot revolvers, the average number of shots fired in an officer-involved shooting was 5.7 rounds, a.k.a. six rounds. When police officers were issued Glocks, the average number of rounds fired in an officer-involved shooting were 16.5 rounds, a.k.a. 17 rounds, because that's what the gun held. You're going to empty the gun. That's what's going to happen. And this is just in an officer-involved shooting. We're not talking about civilians here. It's your natural reaction. You're going to keep pressing that trigger until the threat is neutralized. Whether you are trained that way or it's just your human instinct, you're going to keep... And you see this all the time in bad movies where somebody's running an SADA weapon, you know, where they the gun goes dry and then they're just click, 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 click. That doesn't really happen in real life. But it does happen in the movies because your natural inclination is to keep squeezing the trigger until the threat is neutralized. And so, essentially, magazine capacity has nothing to do with how many people are violently shot with weapons each year. Because the natural inclination is to press the trigger until the magazine goes dry. Which is something that needs to be... Well, we'll talk about training at a later date. The point is... It's a throwaway, nonsense piece of legislation. Most fundamentally, the authors wrote, quote, because the banned guns and magazines were never used in more than a fraction of all gun murders, even the maximum theoretically achievable, preventable effect of the ban on gun murders is almost certainly too small to detect statistically with only one year of post-ban crime data. The two later major studies of the band concluded more years of analysis with more years of analysis concluded that an updated assessment was published in 2004. Specifically, Feinstein's press release found that it was responsible for a 6.7% decrease in total gun murders, holding all other factor, factors equal. And so the bottom line here is both sides are cherry picking from the studies. If you want to jump into this even more, the point is, this massive legislation that will very much so lead to further dividing the country is bull crap on both sides of the argument. Um, now, I am definitely on one side of the argument. I, <laughs> you will not, you will not infringe upon my Second Amendment rights, period, the end. And luckily, I live in the state of Oklahoma where we have state-level uh, laws here that federal gun bans... Uh, federal gun legislation, anything that infringes upon the federal Second Amendment will not be honored in the state of Oklahoma. <laughs> Additionally, we have excellent four Constitution law enforcement in my area, so I don't have that particular worry where I am, but I know a lot of other people do not. And so it brings up the concept of, again, roving units going door to door saying, give me your weapons. And we know that if they try to get a registry, that generally speaking, when it comes to, not generally speaking, historically speaking, that gun registry is always followed by gun confiscation. And genocide is always followed by gun confiscation. So registry, confiscation, genocide. Interestingly enough, I happen to be having a chat with the Ice Age farmer last night, and now I could just be piecing little tiny things together. But he brought up the Deagle predictions. I don't know if anybody's looked at the Deagle predictions, but the current population is listed at roughly 327 million people in the United States of America. And by 2025, Deagle predicts that that population will be 100 million. Where did the other 227 million people go? Again, not fear-mongering, just putting it out there. Go look at the Deagle prediction. D-E-A-G-L-E, -E, Deagle prediction. I don't have links to it here because I wasn't actually prepared to discuss it today. But it's an interesting concept. You know what I mean? 721 people on the chat. Ascension, Enlightenment. Good morning, Carrie Stennett. Not I, but the Spice Girls. I love that freaking name. Robbie from Texas is here. Scott Snyder, Michael McFarlane, Jess Badgers killing it with the blue wrenches. Sammy Barrel. Good morning, Sammy Barrel. Lisa, quite chatty this morning. It's good to see you, Lisa. Refuge Medical Dot com. If you cannot find ammunition to train with, 
why don't you suck it up, Buttercup, and get trained on some TAC Med stuff? We got some dates coming up, uh, Indianapolis and in uh, outside of Atlanta, Cartersville, Georgia area. There are still some dates left for both classes. April 11th, Sunday, 9 to 1 or 2 to 6 in Cartersville, Georgia. And then over here at refugemedical.com, you've got uh, Sunday, April 25th, 9 to 1 or 2 to 6 in Indianapolis. So April 11th, outside of Atlanta, April 25th in Indianapolis. The class costs $350. You will be trained by legit badasses who have hands-on experience with this. It's a four-hour class. The cost of the class includes a North American Rescue TCCC trainer kit, which will be retained by the student. You keep that. And the idea there is force multiplication so that when you leave, you still have the kit to train your wife, your best friend, your buddy from your mutual assistance group, your pastor, your boss at work, your whoever. So you can pass those those skills on. It's force multiplication. And so uh, you, you can take $115 off the coat cost of instruction just with that right there uh it's a it's a our introductory class which is derived from our eight hour TCCC curriculum which is tactical combat casualty care so most stop the bleed classes they throw a tourniquet at you they go here's a tourniquet i'll be back in an hour y'all make sure you don't die we'll give you a nice piece of paper fit for framing have a nice life that's not what we do. It's a four-hour classroom environment. Two hours of that is spent with practical application. You're going to put on tourniquets in all kinds of ways. You're going to do it until it hurts because that means it's working. Emergency trauma dressings, wound packing, chest seals, nasal pharyngeal airways, a discussion about tension pneumothorax and needle decompression, uh, clotting agents, and so much more, as well as the medicine side of that. What is shock? What is trauma? How to deal with it? What does arterial bleeding look like? Response time, situational awareness, the whole nine. Indianapolis area, 25th of April. Cartersville, Georgia, Atlanta area, the 11th of April. RefugeMedical.com. I can't find ammo. I can't train. No, quit being myopic. There's lots of things you can train on, including how to not freaking die. Because if you're carrying a way to make holes, you need to be carrying a way to plug holes. At a minimum, says me. Moving right along. Honda... Uh, is experiencing uh, a halt to its U.S. production facilities. And by the way, if you're on Patreon, you've got this uh, as well. Current issues, 324, the daily brief. It's not daily anymore. It's posted Monday, Wednesday, Friday. So regardless of whether or not I'm coming on here and talking about it, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, this is still going up Monday, Wednesday, Friday on Patreon. So we appreciate your patrons. Thank you for supporting the show. You can go to patreon.com, search for Bear Independent. You'll find us there. It's a buck a month or $10 a year. If you hate it, you're out a dollar. I think you're going to be okay. If you don't hate it, you know, you got access to th between 30 and 100 exclusive pieces of content per month, including this type of content. So from motorbiscuit.com, which is one hell of a name, Honda Toyota factory shutting down temporarily. A year into the pandemic and COVID-19 is having ripple effects on automotive production. The Honda Motor Company and Toyota are just the latest manufacturers to pause production due to supply chain issues. How long will these factories remain behind? Got a nice little infographic here. This is one of those websites that has the whole top third of the screen is taken up by an advertisement. Good times. According to the Wall Street Journal, Toyota, Honda, and Samsung are still having supply chain issues complicating production. From weather-related issues, COVID-19, and problems docking in ports, parts are not making it to the needed destinations in time. In response, Toyota and Honda are halting production at U.S. factories due to a lack of supplies. These supplies include plastic parts, petrochemicals, and semiconductors. Honda specifically blamed issues with a backlog at California ports and freak snow-related issues slowing down production at some factories. Quote, automotive companies initially had to bear the brunt of these shortages, but now it has been spread to pretty much all parts of the consumer electronics sector. Why am I bringing this up? Because it's illustrating that supply chain logistics are breaking down across the board, not just on food, not just on household goods, but now it's starting to affect major industry as well. 
it is my my belief that within the next couple of years, we are very much so going to feel a squeeze when it comes to food production, let alone everything else, which is why you should be stacking your food to the rafters on your food storage, which is why now in springtime 2021, here in the Northern Hemisphere, you should be planting your gardens, whether it, you live in a... Um, if you live in an apartment, you get three five-gallon buckets, drill some holes in the bottom, dump some miracle Grow in there, plant tomatoes, plant peppers, plant cilantro, and then make salsa. Bear, task one, make salsa. It will be wonderful. You'll thank me for it later. Okay, or you live out here in the country where we have literally six different garden plots that we are spinning up right now. Make food appear forth from the ground. Get good at it now because it takes time to get good at growing food. And I don't know how much more time we have as far as the supply chain logistics of the world staying fed, continuing to support us. The system is fragile. And if you're dependent upon the system and it's fragile, it's not going to go well for you. And I would add also caveat asterisk, if you're dependent upon the system, how are you going to refine it and or revolt against it? I've done a lot of remodeling, done a lot of construction. There's nothing worse than remodeling your house while you're living in it. You know what people tend to do? They move out. They go get a hotel. They go somewhere else so that the impact of those efforts aren't negatively affecting their daily life. They remove themselves from the system so that the system can be reformed and or replaced. But if you're suckling on the teat of big government, how are you ever going to revolt against it? And the answer is you're not. So that's all just you know fun and games and fake, fake patriot shenaniganry on the internet. Back to the article. Due to the pandemic, semiconductors specifically are in short supply due to the increased use of various entertainment needs. This includes computers, tablets, televisions, and phones. Manufacturers around the world were unprepared for the increase, which has officially spread to the automotive sector. How long will this impact factories? China apocalypse is too real. Toyota Honda shut U.S. factories as supplies run short. <sighs> Over here, Mack Truck, which is the parent company of Volvo, to slow truck production amid semiconductor shortage. So it's not just your Honda, your Toyota, it's also Max and Volvos. Why is that important? Because it's something like 93% of everything you touch in your daily life was on the back of a semi at some point. And as these things cycle out over time, the maintenance and replacement of said vehicles as they go down, is it's just further stresses the supply chain logistics, which is why we need decentralized production means. That's what bare independent means. I want to be as independent from the system as possible. Am I great at it? No, but I'm trying every day, getting a little bit better at being able to take care of me and mine and the people that we do life with versus every day walking blindly through life thinking that it's going to be okay. Because we can read the writing on the wall, it's not going to be okay. And if it is going to be okay, it's because we have taken the time, put in the effort to make it that, that way, not subcontracted it out to somebody else, i.e. the federal government. Heavy-duty trucks like the ones Mack Truck assembles in the Lehigh Valley use semiconductors and several components in the vehicle's engine, transmission controls, and beyond. Trucking industry analyst Steve Tam said there can be as many as 17 computer locations in a truck and double that in some cases. I mean, just look at this dash right here. If you don't think that that dash is filled with electronics, you're smoking dope. They are used prolifically throughout the truck, Tam said. So a global semiconductor shortage like the one happening right now can create headaches for truck makers trying to keep up with demand. That scenario led to an announcement Monday by Max parent company, the Sweden-based Volvo Group, in which it said the shortage will have a substantial impact on the company's production in the second quarter. And it goes on and on and on and on and on. This is an economic indicator as well as a supply chain indicator. So I strongly advise you guys and girls to adjust your OODA loop, observe, orient, decide, act. What are we acting on? Self-reliance. Grindstone Ministries. Uh, for those who are following along in the home game, Caleb House, got uh, we got our 501c3 yesterday. And I've seen a few people say, oh, great, now you got to be careful what you got to say. Uh, well, let's start with this. Kiss my hairy white ass. How's that go? 
Um, we are stoked as hell that Grindstone Ministries now has the official covering of the 501c3. Not that we need the government's permission to do what we do because we've been doing it for going on two years without their permission, but because with that 501c3 that now enables us to give um, our, we were in pending status, which means that your donations were already tax deductible. But when you're in pending status, large corporate donors will not donate to you. And we've had several large <laughs> corporate donors that have wanted to donate to us but have been unable to do so because we were in pending status, didn't actually have a 501c3. So that opens up the possibility now for us to partner with these people to support our mission to break generational curses and to provide a biblical covering to orphans with Caleb House, which is a restoration facility for juvenile trafficking survivors. The critical need in trafficking is not law enforcement, although law enforcement is excellent. It's not prevention and education, although prevention and education are excellent. It's not even rescue, although rescue is excellent. It's restoration. What do we do with these children after they're rescued? This is a $150 billion per year industry, billion dollar per year industry in the United States of America, and there are only 420 sanctioned beds, DHS sanctioned beds in the Estados Unidos, the lower 48 to combat this abomination and so what grindstone is doing is building and staffing more of these restoration facilities we just got done with bethany house last year we're on to caleb house this year and i want to be the mcdonald's of restoration facilities i want to build a thousand of them before i die and so caleb house now has its 501c3 if you want to get plugged in with that you can find us at grindstoneministries.com Please sign up for the newsletter here because when we deploy this spring to southwestern Arkansas to go work with another restoration ministry, the way you're going to find about that, find out about that and how to plug in is via that newsletter. We don't spam you. We don't sell your information. We just send you mission scope, mission profile so you know what we got going, where it's going on, what you need to do to come join us with that. If you'd like to donate now, we are diligently saving towards land for Caleb House. You can click this Donate Now button. It'll take you to our online giving portal. And then down here, there's a Contact Us page if you need an address to send a physical check or something like that. Lastly on today, shout out to uh, Liberty and Yankee. They're having a baby. There's a link right here in the description. If you want to do something nice for somebody today, Liberty and Yankee are having a baby. If you'd like to buy them something uh, to help offset their off-grid neo-pioneering lifestyle cost of living, you could get them a nice fuzzy baby blanket or whatever. Uh, these are awesome people. We love them. You got the list down in the description and also on Patreon. And that's going to do it for today's live stream. May the Father bless you. May the Father protect you. May the Father make his face shine upon you and may you experience his peace and his shalom this day. Bless y'all. Bear out.